I know what my mission in life is. My mission in life is to fight for the least of these, as my grandmother would say, to help the Davids uh, fight the Goliaths. And certainly that was a David Goliath situation. And once we won it and knew that we could defeat Goliath, I said, bring them on. I'm Jack Newton, CEO of Clio, and this is the Daily Matters podcast. On Daily Matters, we talk with legal professionals, industry leaders, and subject matter experts about the future of law. We explore where the legal industry is headed, how legal practice is changing, and what you can be doing to position yourself for success. Today's guest is Ben Crump, founder and principal owner of Ben Crump Law. Nicknamed Black America's Attorney General, Ben has established himself as one of the nation's foremost lawyers and advocates for social justice. Ben's tireless advocacy has led to legislation preventing excessive force and developing implicit bias training and policies. Ben is known for representing families in several high profile civil rights cases, including Trayvon Martin, Michael Brown, Stephen Clark, as well as the residents of Flint, Michigan. Recently, Ben has been attorney to the families of George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, Ahmaud Arbery, and Jacob Blake. Ben was a keynote speaker at the 2020 Clio Cloud Conference, which took place virtually from October 13th to 16th. It's an honor to have you on the show, Ben. Hey, an honor to be here, Jack. Thank you so much again for all you all do at Clio. I remember when I was in law school, Clio was one of the things that propelled many uh, minority students into the field of law. So God bless you for doing that. Thank you. I'm so glad to uh, to hear that. I'm going to be sure to to pass that on to the team that will that will make their day hearing that. Uh, Ben, starting off, can you take us through some of the most significant cases of your career? Uh, for, for those of, of our listeners that might not be familiar with your background, walk us through some of your experiences, some of the most important cases you've worked on. Certainly. And Jack, I, I think all of them are equally important, but some of the more notable cases uh, that are known in American jurisprudence is uh, I had the honor of representing the family of Trayvon Martin who was killed in Sanford, Florida in 2012 while he walked home from the 7-Eleven with a bag of Skittles and a can of iced tea and a neighborhood watch volunteer profile pursued and shot and killed him. Uh, And that is what many believe was the uh, initial cause for Black Lives Matter. Uh, I've also had the opportunity to represent the family of Michael Brown, Junior, who was killed in Ferguson, Missouri, and many of the witnesses in the Canfield community said he had his hands up and uh, uh, rallying and call, hands up, don't shoot, went all across the world. Uh, had the opportunity to represent the family of 12-year-old Tamir Rice, who was killed in Cleveland, Ohio by the police while playing on the playground. Uh, represented the family of right now, currently Ahmaud Aubrey. Uh, the family of Breonna Taylor in Louisville, Kentucky, who was killed in the St. day of her own apartment while the Louisville Metropolitan Police Department was executing, I believe, an unconstitutional, uh, an illegal, and a dangerous no-not warrant at her apartment at one o'clock in the morning and resulted in that innocent Black woman being executed. Uh, and Ahmaud Arbery, as you all uh, know, I'm sure, was lynched in 2020 for jogging while black in Brunswick, Georgia. Um, And then obviously everyone knows I represent George Floyd's family who uh, was literally tortured to death while a Minneapolis police officer kept his knee on his neck for eight minutes and 46 seconds. Uh, And most recently, I have been retained to represent the family of Jacob Blake Jr., who was shot seven times at point blank range in Kenosha, Wisconsin, by his three little boys, ages eight years old, five years old, and three year old, was sitting in the car and witnessed the police shoot and paralyze their father, uh, which caused the National Basketball Association to literally boycott the NBA playoffs. Um, and then I represented thousands of the children of Flint, Michigan, who, uh, I mean, just tragically 
because of the land water crisis have brain damage, uh, represent thousands of uh, women of color against Johnson and Johnson uh, as a result of them having ovarian cancer that they believe was caused by the use of Johnson and Johnson's baby powder, which is uh, scientifically known as talcum powder. And uh, many other cases, what I do is I go fight for people who have been marginalized, disenfranchised and disrespected to say that they have a right to equal justice under the law by virtue of them being American citizens. Thank you for the incredible work you do, Ben. And, and you've obviously helped shape the, the path of American society going forward. You've worked on some of the most profound and important cases of our time. And I, I, I'd be interested in hearing a little bit more about your, your path to being the person you are today and, and being as relentlessly focused on social justice as you are. Can you give us a little bit of your, your background and your, your story and what led you to the, the point you're at in your career today? Absolutely, Jack, and it's uh, very simple for me. Two reasons why I think I am who I am today. Uh, the first is my mother, Helen Crump. All that I am is because of her. She uh, sacrificed so much to raise me and my two little brothers. Uh, she worked two jobs, uh, one, uh, doing laundry at a hotel in the mornings and then working in the factory in the evenings to make sure that we had food on the table, that we had a roof over our head and that we had the lights on and that we had hope in our heart. And so my mother did all of that and she always told me, Jack, that life isn't fair, it's hard. She said, you make it fair by what you bring to the table. And if you don't bring anything to the table, my mother said, don't let anybody, uh, don't expect anybody to let you sit down at the table. And so she always would tell me that she indoctrinated it in my mind. And so uh, she said, education was something important to bring to the table because once you got it up here, nobody could take it away from you. And I remember when I graduated from college at Florida State University, uh, I told my mama, I'm bringing something to the table. Uh, and I tried to use that education as productively as I know how to make room for others at the table. Um, because she always taught me that not enough for you to sit down at the table, but you have to have room for others who are marginalized to also have an opportunity to sit at the table. And then secondly, uh, I just remember, and I remember it like it was yesterday, when I was in the fourth grade, we, I was nine years old, uh, they bus the little black children in my little small town in Lumberton, North Carolina, uh, across the tracks uh, to the white community uh, where they had the newer school, the newer, books, the newer facilities, newer technology, everything was better. And I just remember being amazed at how much they had. And as I was on the school bus going literally back across the tracks to South Lumberton to the black community, um, and I noticed all the dilap dilapidated buildings uh, in my old elementary school that had lead paint, that had the old raggedy books. And I remember thinking, Jack, why is it that certain people in certain communities have it so good while certain people that live in our community have it so challenging? And my mother told me it was because of Brown versus the Board of Education and an attorney named Thurgood Marshall. And I decided right then that I was gonna grow up and be an attorney like Thurgood Marshall so I can fight to make uh, people who live in my community have a better chance at the American dream. People who look like me have a better chance at achieving equal justice under the law. And from that day to this one, that's what I have endeavored to do. And that's why Thurgood Marshall is my personal hero. And I continue to try to fight for equal justice to make a better world for all our children, just like Justice Marshall did. 
Ben, I'm also curious from a, from a, obviously that's a, a powerful inspiration for where you got started in your, your, your legal career and your education, this, this focus on, on fighting for civil rights and the, the, the cases that, that you've been handling over the, the past few years. Tell us a little bit more about how that particular focus came to uh, develop. Were these cases that you, you, you sought out or these cases that came to you and ended up becoming uh, a specialty, so to speak? Yeah, you know, Jack, when my um, former law partner, Daryl Parks and I started our law firm, we started right out of law school. We turned down all our job offers and said, no, nope, we want to go do the kind of law we believe in and help our community. You, uh, you hung a shingle. We hung a shingle. And Jack, you know, ignorance is bliss. <laughs> if we knew what we were facing, we never would have did it. But we were young and confident, probably a little naive. Uh, but we did it and God blessed us. And we started getting calls on cases. We were doing all kinds of cases, rent law, you criminal, personal injury, whatever, to pay the bills. And we got pretty good at doing criminal law and started getting a reputation, walking people out the courtroom when they had been charged with these trumped up charges. And then I got the call from Martin Lee Anderson's mother. That was the 14 year old little boy who was beaten, punched, kicked, uh, choked, and had ammonia tablets stuck up his nose on his first day at the Bay County Sheriff's boot camp. And I remember his mother, when she called me, she said that she had already talked to two lawyers and they literally, she said, the last lawyer told her uh, that I already saw this movie before. I know how it's going to end. They're going to say, your son, a little black boy was resisting and the police uh, was trying to subdue him. And that's how he died. And, you know, nothing's going to happen. And she said, but that lawyer said, I know these two uh, young black lawyers. They are, they kind of crazy. They're not afraid to take on the police. And so uh, she called me and uh, obviously she lost her son. She was heartbroken, but she told me, Jack, and I think this burnt a hole in my heart that still burns today. She said, uh, and I understand if you don't take the case attorney Crump, because people like me we don't get justice. And that hit me like a ton of bricks. What did she mean? People like me, did she mean poor people? Did she mean black people? Did she mean marginalized people? Uh, people like me, we don't get justice. And I took it that case and it was Trayvon Martin before there was a such thing as Trayvon Martin. Right. I mean, it got a lot of attention, but the internet had not taken off the way they did in social media. But that motivated me, and we fought tirelessly for that 14-year-old little boy. Governor Jeb Bush was the governor of Georgia, and we were able to sue the state of Florida and recover the highest amount ever paid out by the state of Florida for an individual wrongful death uh, by the government. And tragically, none of those officers that we saw in that grainy uh, police uh, surveillance videotape from the boot camp went to jail for murdering this 14 year old kid on TV, literally. And so that has always motivated me. It's not a well known case as. The other high profile cases that uh, I have worked, but it's probably one of the most important one because it set me on this trajectory to say that I know what my mission in life is. My mission in life is to fight for the least of these, as my grandmother would say, to help the Davids uh, fight the Goliaths. And certainly that was a David Goliath situation. And once we won it, and knew that we could defeat Goliath, I said, bring them on. I, I think that's such an inspirational story for, for especially the younger lawyers that might be listening as well. And I'm, I'm curious what you might say, Ben, you, you 
you probably had an opportunity come at you as, as this two person law firm that, that you probably would have never had the chance to, to tackle if you'd taken one of those job offers from a big firm. If you have the chance to speak to a you know, younger self, a younger Ben, what, what would you say to, to yourself or to any young lawyer listening about doing work that, that matters? And especially as we see so many lawyers get into practice and become almost disenfranchised once they feel like they're not pursuing the, the social justice mission they, they felt they might've been when they got inspired to be a lawyer in the first place. Yeah, you know, Jack, I, what I would say to young lawyers is never forget why you went to law school. Never forget why you became a lawyer. And, and I understand people gotta make a living. So if you have to go take a job to provide income for you and your family, understand that. But you can always do something to help the struggle for equality for all people in, a, in not just America, but in the world. Uh, I, I like what Dr. King said. He said, we all have a role to play in this struggle. Uh, everybody can't be on the front lines with uh, Black Lives Matter and Reverend Al and myself. Uh, some people are going to be doing pro bono work at their corporate law firm. And that's just as important as what we're doing. Some people are going to go down and uh, file motions and briefs with the city government and the municipalities to say that we need after school programs, we need mentoring programs, we need uh, access to healthcare programs and so forth. And that's just important, as important as being on the front line saying Black Lives Matter or anything else. And so never ever be discouraged to say that you can't make a difference because as Dr. King said, we all have the ability to make a difference in the world because we all have the ability to serve our fellow man. We all have that ability, Jack. And that's what you all do so incredibly. You don't know how y'all impact the world when y'all expose these young lawyers. Sometimes first generation lawyers never have a lawyer in their family. And you give them the confidence and the inspiration to go say, you can go be a lawyer and you can have the power of the constitution behind you to go hold the powerful accountable to the least of us. And that's what it's about, trying to make sure we all do whatever our role is in the struggle. Ben, I'm curious to hear your perspective on, on what the future holds. You mentioned earlier you are involved in Trayvon Martin's case, which sparked in many ways the, the Black Lives Matter movement and George Floyd's case, which, which catalyzed this huge worldwide movement that, that is ongoing in, in so many ways. And I'm, I'm curious to, to hear from you if, if you're optimistic that we're, we're starting to see permanent change in our society or, or, or not. Or, or have you felt like there's been a, a tipping point in what's happened after especially George Floyd's killing? I, I do think George Floyd uh, if you saw that tragic video, you could not unsee that video where he literally narrated the documentary of his own murder by those who were supposed to protect and serve him. Uh, and so I do think this is a moment that we have to transform into a movement, that uh, we have to transform the pain we all collectively felt when we watched that video into a sense of power. We have to transform all the protests that's going on in cities all across the world into policy. And literally, we have to do that. Uh, we cannot lose this moment. I do believe that we are at a tipping point. And this is our moment to get real systematic reform and change the coaching behavior of policing in America, uh, but also change this discriminatory, I believe, racist criminal justice system that exists in America. Uh, why America has been dealing with the COVID-19 pandemic 
we in Black America have been dealing with the 1619 pandemic. That represents the year that the first enslaved Africans were brought to America. And Jack, from that year to now, for 401 years, we have been dealing with systematic racism and oppression. And it doesn't matter what President Trump and uh, Attorney General Barr say when they say they don't believe that there's systematic racism in America. There's all kind of data and statistics. I mean, when you just look at the incarceration rates, when you look at the rates on death row, when you look at the access to capital and the uh, gap in wealth disparities between uh, minorities and white people, when you look at the access to healthcare in America, I mean, it's just everywhere. And so we cannot solve this problem until we first admit that it is a problem and then we can get to a solution. So we have to always try to be honest with one another. We strive for a more perfect union. You know, we swear our oath to uphold that constitution, but that constitution says we are always striving for a more perfect union. And so when you ask me, am I optimistic? I am, Jack, because I see the young people and I see the multi-generational and the multicultural and the multi-geographical people coming together saying that Breonna Taylor life matters, that Ahmaud Aubrey life matters, that until George Floyd get justice, then none of us can breathe. And you see black, white, Hispanic, Asian, everybody saying that. So I'm encouraged uh, and I will say this, we must always remember that it is a journey to justice. Sometimes you take one step forward and two steps back, but you remember it's a journey and you don't give up on the journey because I do believe we as a people, we will complete this journey together. Ben, you, you obviously have the, a unique role in, in in history in the the cases you're you're involved in, and I'm I'm curious to hear about how you think about your own place in history and what kind of legacy you would like to to leave if you're reflecting back on your your career at at some point in the future. What would you like to think of as the legacy you've left behind? <laughs> I, I like to think I'm still young. So <laughs> um, well, I'm not saying this is coming anytime soon, but if, you know, in the far distant future. I hear you, brother. Uh, <laughs> no, I think first it starts at the beginning. I, I, I uh, am Helen Crump's son, and that is part of my legacy. Um, I, I wrote a, a best-selling book, and hopefully I get a chance to write more in the future, uh, but it's called Open Season, The Legalized Genocide of Colored People, published by HarperCollins. And it talks about this battle we're in for the, a more just society, uh, a better America uh, for all of our children. And, and then I, I you know, I, I'm humbled by Reverend Allen, Congresswoman, uh, Maxine Waters and those who have uh, exalted me as Black America's Attorney General because they say right now we don't have one. <laughs> um, and I think about having this legacy where they said he tried to speak truth to power. My grandmother told me when I was younger, she said, baby, if you ever get a chance to speak truth to power, you do it. She said, you do it. And so I like to believe that part of my legacy is speaking truth to power. And the fact, Jack, that I go in courtrooms all over America and I do try to expose the legalized genocide of colored people and the fact that when I question jurors all over this country during jury selection, I, I literally ask them, I say, I know that you can quote the preamble to the Declaration of Independence, but what I wanna know, Jack Newton, is do they believe it? I wanna know, do they believe it when they say, we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equally, that they're endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights that amongst them are life and liberty and the pursuit of happiness. Well, 
that means black people to America. And so hopefully that will be part of my legacy, making America live up to its creed. That it is equal justice under the law and that all our children have an equal opportunity at the American dream. Ben, I'd also like to hear your perspective on how how you think we as individuals can have this kind of impact. And, and if we're, we're to be working toward the kind of transformation in society that we all want to see, or at least some of us want to see. And as, as you pointed out, even recognizing that there's transformation to be done uh, is a starting point for some of these discussions. But when, when you're speaking to individuals, and I, and I know I've, I've heard a lot of this in the conversations I've had about addressing issues around systemic racism and, and creating a more fair and just and, and equal society, people want to know what they can do to, to help and, and contribute to that, that mission. When you hear that question, how do you answer? Well, it's like we talked about before. Everybody has a role to play. I hope everybody will participate in our democracy in two weeks. Uh, mm -hmm. I, I'm clearly supporting my dear friend Kamala Harris and uh, Vice President Joe Biden for president. But you want people to be involved in democracy, whether on the national level, but also on the state level and the local level. Uh, because people have to know that it all takes all of us. I'll tell you a quick story. And I know my people are telling me time is always getting to me. A lot going on in the world today with George Floyd and Breonna Taylor's case. I'm sure. Um, but I, on Juneteenth, uh, the African-American celebration of independence in America, uh, I this was about a month after George Floyd was killed. I was speaking, having a fireside chat uh, with the CEO of Truist Bank. They brought me in to deliver uh, a speech on diversity, inclusion, and such. And uh, they had about 2,000 of their bankers listening to us on Zoom. And Mr. Kelly King, who is this older white uh, gentleman who's the CEO, uh, yeah, probably a little more conservative than me, I would guess, uh, but in introducing me, he said something profound, Jack. He said, uh, we brought Ben here to speak to us today because there's a lot going on in America. And he said, I remember one of my friends came and knocked on my door the other day, who's an older white man like me. Uh, and he said, Kelly, man, do you see what's going on out there? with all these protests. I mean, the streets are burning. Cities are on fire. He said, man, I can't believe it. And so, man, he said, his friend said, we gotta call somebody. And Kevin said he reflected as he looked at his friend. He said, well, I don't know somebody's name. I don't know somebody's phone number, and I don't know somebody's address. And so he said, he looked at his friend, and he said, where are somebody's? Where are somebody's, you and I, who gotta help make the change that we seek? And that's what I say to everybody who's listening to this podcast. We are the somebody's to make it a better America, a more just America, where George Floyd has an opportunity to breathe a more just society where Breonna Taylor has a better opportunity to sleep in peace, uh, a more just America where Ahmaud Aubrey has an opportunity to run free and not be lynched for jogging while black and uh, while all our children have an equal opportunity at the American dream and to life and liberty in the pursuit of happiness. We are the somebodies to do that. So everybody can do something, even if it's just mentoring a young person who doesn't look like you, doesn't come from your zip code, that doesn't have a similar life uh, experience or background as you. And in trying to help that young person, you might just learn a lot too. Ben, maybe my closing question, I, I loved your response to, to my last question. My, my closing question maybe is uh, 
picking up on a, a note you chatted about with with Shaka at the the Clio Cloud conference, and that was a discussion around what criminal justice reform can can look like, how important it is, but but more so what a more just system might look like. And I'd love to hear your perspective, especially as our, our listenership is made up of people that can have impacts in this space. I'd love to hear a description from you of what, what a more just system could look like and what kind of reforms you think need to take place. And it's real straightforward to me, Jack. Uh, I think about what has been passed by the United States House of Representatives in the George Floyd Justice and Police and Accountability Act. I mean, those measures that deal with abolishing the chokehold. Many people don't know the chokehold is legal in most cities in America. And over 70% of the time in most states is black men and uh, brown men being choked. And they're not choking white men and so forth. And so what happened to George Floyd was foreseeable. Even if you don't consider what they did five years ago to Eric Garner, if they keep choking, black men, eventually bad things are gonna happen, tragic fatalities. Secondly, abolishing no not warrants. It was foreseeable that Breonna Taylor was gonna happen. I mean, they busting the doors and it's disproportionately, these no not warrants are executed against black people. They're not busting in white people houses at one o'clock in the morning. Uh, and so it was foreseeable. Uh, dealing with the transparency with the body cameras, because I do think the issue is mistrust. And the solution to mistrust is to have one transparency plus accountability equals trust. We got to see that when police do bad things to us, that the system works equally for us too. And that there's not two justice systems in America, one for black America and one for white America. And that's why we need that transparency and that accountability to get us to trust. And then obviously you talk about qualified immunity. We got to be able to hold these people accountable. If the United States Supreme Court is giving instructions to kill the cops that when they kill marginalized people, you got a, a playbook to say, this is your get out of jail free card. All you got to do is say three words. I felt threatened. I felt uh, harmed. You know, and that's all they got to say. And then they say, oh, you can't Monday morning quarterback the police, despite all the objective evidence to see that they shot the black man in the back running away. And yet they keep saying, I felt fear. Well, why do you feel fear for somebody running away from you? You look at Jacob Blake in Kenosha, Wisconsin, who was clearly running away from the police, trying to get away from them, and they felt the need to shoot them seven times in the back and paralyze them. And then you look 48 hours later at the young white man, Kyle Wittenhouse, who shot three people, killing two of them, and then walked down the street with a semi-automatic weapon hanging from his neck and literally walked past several police and several National Guards. Nobody killed him. Nobody shot him in the back. He made it to his home in another state and injured. And now, if that doesn't emphasize that we have two justice systems in America, Jacob Blake didn't shoot nobody, got shot seven times in the back, going away from the police, a young white man walking towards you with an assault weapon, and nobody sees him as a threat or a fear. And so we have to work on being very honest with each other, and that's the legal aspects of it. And you know, I said the police are the low people on the pole, but it's the entire criminal justice system and the institutions of government that exist in America that have to admit that there is systematic racism in America so we can get to a solution. And then the final answer I would say is simply this. It's what the great Ella Baker, the civil rights icon said. Uh, she founded the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee with John Lewis and other young people. She said that until white mothers cry just as hard when the police kill little black boys as they would if they kill their own children, then we won't get the change we seek in America. We have to see each other with dignity and respect and humanity. And when we do that, then we can get to what Dr. King called the beloved community. And that's what we're all fighting to have 
where we can raise our children in that community. Um, and, and I'll say in conclusion, uh, you know, as Thurgood Marshall said, the basis of the American constitution is simply this, that a black baby born to a black mother, the most uneducated black mother, the most impoverished black mother, the most inarticulate black mother uh, has the same exact rights as a, ba a white baby born to a white mother, the most educated white mother, the most articulate white mother, the most affluent white mother, just by virtue of that baby drawing its first breath as an American. Now, Justice Marshall said, I know that's not the case in America today, but I challenge anybody to say that's not a goal worth fighting for. I challenge anybody to say that's not what makes America the great beacon of hope and justice for all the world to marvel. So when we fight for the Trayvon Martins of the world, but more importantly, when we fight for the unknown Trayvon Martins of the world and George Floyds of the world and Breonna Taylors of the world and Stephon Clarks of the world and Botham Jones of the world and the Terrence Crutches of the world and the Tamir Rices of the world, when we fight for who my grandmother called the least of these, what we are really doing, Jack Newton, is helping America live up to its creed. What we're really doing, Cleo, is helping America be that great beacon of hope and justice for all the world to marvel. But most importantly, what we are doing is helping America be America for all Americans. Ben, that's a wonderful and, and powerful note to end on. Uh, I'll let you get back to the important work that I know you need to, to tend to, but uh, it was a huge honor having you on the show today. Thank you for joining us and look forward to chatting again at some point in the future. Hey, thank you, Jack. Keep fighting the power, brother. Thanks for joining us on Daily Matters, a podcast from Clio. Rate and review wherever you get your podcasts and subscribe so that you never miss an episode. Daily Matters is produced by Andrew Booth, Sam Rosenthal, and Derek Bolin, and hosted by yours truly, Jack Newton. Thanks also to Clio, the world's leading cloud-based legal technology provider, for supporting this podcast.